items uh, while we get this up and running. I'll walk through the 327 syllabus and the uh, 858 syllabus at the same time. There's a uh, similarity between the two, some difference. Similarity is the same person's teaching it. <laughs> and uh, you're here together, same subject, yes, not two subjects at the same time. Uh, yes. Oh, wonderful. There we go. Scotland? It's not Scotland. <laughs> That's Egypt. The warm and sunny part of Scotland. <laughs> uh, St. Catherine Monastery in Egypt, which sits at the foot of uh, what is purportedly Mount Sinai. All right, walking through the syllabi, um, we meet Tuesdays, 4.05 to 5 p.m. And uh, my office phone number there and email address, uh, of course, now you can just do the prts.edu to shorten things up a bit, as William Van Dudeward is long enough to type out. Good thing about computers is once you've done it once, it's there. Uh, course description. In this course, we are actually says so Scottish Presbyterianism from the beginning of the 17th century to the 19th century, we're actually covering the sweep uh, right from the Reformation onwards. Um, so we'll be walking right through, and actually I'll give you a little preface to that by looking at uh, the history of the church in Scotland from the early times through medieval today and uh, going forward from there. And, but we certainly will give a substantial attention uh, to the uh, 1600s post-Reformation era and, and beyond uh, the 18th century and 19th century. I'm going to give some good attention to the period of the adoption of the Westminster Standards and their formulation uh, up through the Marrow Controversy and secession movements. And we'll be looking at the covenants, covenanting, Scottish influence on the Westminster Assembly, period of the persecution, uh, reestablishment of Presbyterianism, and then specific theologians like Samuel Rutherford, uh, Gillespie, Dixon, Durham, and the others mentioned there. And we'll take it right up into the 20th century by the time we roll around to the end of April. Uh, hopefully we'll be uh, looking at the 20th century, um, or the state of the Church of Scotland in that time period, and then some of the other bodies, the Free Church of Scotland. and. Uh, Smaller. Yeah. Okay, so I have to look at that to move the mouse. Okay, no problem. Okay. All right. Okay. You know, I do have a little HDMI adapter. I don't know if that would help in my yeah. laptop case, but I forgot it upstairs. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's that would solve the problem next time. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, in terms of course objectives, well, the goal for all of you, uh, regardless of which uh, subsection you're in, is to have a thorough understanding of the history of Scottish Presbyterianism so you can identify key figures, movements, events, documents, contours and content of theological treatises, issues and controversies, and be able to assess those within the context of Scottish church history and with scripture and the Reformed Confessions. And then the goal as well, that what we learn from this will have practical and doctrinal ministry benefits uh, for gospel ministry today. Uh, so drawing from this historical period to contemporary context of ministry. And so that's, of course, what we desire in everything. We're not just studying it for the sake of studying history that there would be practical benefit. Course requirements. Uh, you see uh, in both, uh, whatever section you're in, you're going to need to write a paper. And uh, the approximate lengths of those papers stated there. And uh, that would be in Times New Roman 12-point font, double-spaced. Would be 30 to 45 pages for the THM students. 10 pages for the MDiv student, and uh, your course, finally, if you're in the THM, it's a three-credit course. For the MDiv students, it's just a one-credit course, and hence the difference in 
of work. Difference in weighting of work also plays out in how much we need. Uh, the uh, required readings there. I hope you've been able to acquire these. They're all available only on the used book market. Uh, they're all also available in the library. So they are, we do have copies of them upstairs. And uh, you're free to avail yourself of the photocopier. Um, I think with an out-of-print book, we have educational institutions. You have certain copying rights if you're not doing it for sales for educational purposes. I believe there's no violation if you're photocopying sections of this as long as you don't do the whole book. Double check with the librarian on that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> skip the index or you know skip chapter five or something like that. Just read it in the book. Uh, photocopy the rest. I don't know. <laughs> Acknowledgements, table of contents. You might want to keep that. Uh, but uh, hopefully you can acquire them because they are good. Uh, they're all good uh, surveys, good basic solid uh, surveys that are helpful. McLeod's Scottish Theology, a classic. I think every pastor should have on their shelves just as a good survey of Scottish theology. Burley, just a good history. And Walker zooms in specifically on the theologians and somewhat like McLeod but with some different focus than McLeod. So um, uh, do read uh, from those. Uh, the pages to read are noted there. Uh, it's not all of Burley that you would read, but it is all of McLeod and all of Walker. Uh, I have talked to a few people about finding copies of McLeod. Uh, it seems at this point that there are more copies available in the UK than there are in North America, and uh, more cheaply in the UK than in North America, though there is shipping to bring it across. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing you can do, again, is read it in the library or cut some deal with somebody who has it where you uh, rent it from them or something, or maybe they graciously let you read it on certain days. More questions. Yes. Now you let it, is, is the, the uh, thermostat suppressor on in this room because it's really cold? And yeah. I can't hear that. We're close to the window. It's very cold. It really is it cold? 64. 64? Yeah. I'm Canadian. <laughs> and I'm Scottish. So. It's very comfortable in here to me. No <laughs> <laughs> I can't see my breath in the air. It's you know, it's warm. <laughs> They've probably fixed it that way to save money. Yeah. You're in Michigan, and the Dutchmen are in control of the thermometer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then uh, recommended reading. I've got a list there of uh, things that uh, would be great for you to read, that you are recommended to read, including a list there of ecclesiastical documents, uh, which we will be discussing uh, in class. And... Uh, uh, those individual authors there will be talking about all of those authors. And those are just some of the great um, classics, you could say, of Scottish Presbyterianism that are listed there. Then there's also a list of recommended secondary sources beyond uh, the ones that are required for reading. And uh, again, uh, these are on particular, many of them focused on particular eras or individuals that, uh, again, are helpful secondary reading and uh, just a place to take a look if you're thinking about a paper topic. Um, some helpful titles there. One that I will mention, which is the, uh, the go-to source for when you write a paper, 
This, the Dictionary of Scottish Church History and Theology. Very, very expensive. Um, but the library has a copy. And when you write your paper, whatever you write it on in Scottish church history, um, it'll be, there'll be an article in here on that topic. Once it's alphabetical, it's like an encyclopedia. And so it, it has all kinds of different figures. Uh, it goes beyond Scottish Presbyterianism. It includes Scottish Congregationalists, Episcopalians, Baptists. Um, gives the whole gamut of Scottish church history and theology from uh, Columba, the early, early period, right to the 20th century. So a wonderful resource, helpful on individuals, on theological terms, movements, writings. Uh, this will be the place to go. Uh, if you don't know what to write your paper on, you could always just sort of flip through and point your finger on a page and see what you come up with. Um, So do, do remember the Scottish, uh, the Dictionary of Scottish Church History and Theology uh, when you come. Each, at the end of each little essay in there, there's also a little bibliography of five or seven sources that they, they list. And so that gives you, again, a little foothold into writing a paper uh, as well. Then there's a topical list of sources. And uh, for the THM students, uh, you're going to be doing select readings uh, from these topic areas. And you're going to need to select one of those topic areas and actually present on it in class. Towards the end of this class, we're going to be doing seminars. And those seminars, so you're going to be doing a seminar on your paper. So prior to handing it in, you'll actually present to the class uh, your material uh, towards the end of the class. Uh, so that's, that comes uh, end of March and onwards. We'll be doing that. And you'll also, so you'll be presenting your paper topic, but you also need to choose uh, one of these topic areas in which to do reading as a THM student. Okay, so one of those listed here. Um, it may overlap with your paper, um, but it can't be exactly the same as your paper, what you present. So let's say you decided to do worship, and you do wanted to do one specific aspect of worship as your paper. You could do two presentations, one on the topic area of worship, using these readings and sources, um, and then one specifically in your paper. Yep. So Right. Issue, and then obviously our paper we're reading, honing in on right. a particular question. Yeah, and in the topic area of reading, you can, if you present in that topic area, you can hone in on something as well. Okay. You know, because one of the categories there is Presbyterianism mm -hmm. as a form of church government. Yeah. Well, you might want to hone in simply on the elder. Yeah. Um, so that's fine. You could also write a paper on the elder. But basically what I'm saying is that as you look ahead, you should be prepared as a THM student to do two presentations, one on your paper and one drawn from your reading area. Are you going to do those in May after the uh, We'll start doing those at the end of March. Okay. So I'm giving you a heads up now. Do, do, can we, I don't know if you made the audio plan to do this, can we arrange to do the ones on the, the readings first? Yes. Yeah, I was thinking of that. We'll start with the ones on the readings, and then we'll do the paper yep. presentations um, later on. Mm -hmm. So probably the last two weeks of the class, we'll do some paper presentations. Would we be doing once we finish our reading from the reading and presentation? Right. And uh, from our paper? Another presentation. And uh, I still, one thing I need to do, because this is the one factor, it depends on how many students are in the class, I have to mathematically calculate how long those presentations will be. 
Um, and we do have some distance students, but distance students aren't off the hook in this one because we can beam you up on the screen and uh, you can share with us. So distance students who are THM students, keep this in mind, uh, you will be presenting as well. In a Not in a PowerPoint, uh, like in a Skype session, you'll be talking to us. Yeah. You're a distance student, so yeah, we'll, we'll use uh, Skype or a format like that that class, we'd get Chris or Felipe can probably do it as well. Um, we just beam you in and we see your face, grand sized, speaking to us. It will be at the same time as our uh, on Tuesday, so it's not that first time in this week. Yeah, it'll be on the, on the uh, normal class time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there will be no, you know, needing to schedule anything different. A week yes. before the presentation takes place, I'll do actually a form, so I'll make sure that everything is the first night is done. Good. Good. We will do that. <coughs> it is in the syllabus, yes. Uh, we would start them March 31st. All right. Uh, and so, so as you look at, the, I think, these topic areas here, this topical bibliography, one, you have to do reading in a topic area anyways. Second, do them both from the same, or you may decide, look, I have a real interest in Scottish devotional literature, plus I'm interested in the office of elder. So maybe I'll do my 10-minute presentation on Presbyterian view of eldership among Scottish Presbyterians, and I'll do my paper on uh, Henry Skugel's The Life of God and the Soul of Man, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, you might be, have a real interest in <coughs> Scottish expository Bible commentaries. How did they write Bible commentaries? Why did they, you know, follow a certain... ...you about the topics in the presbytery and they're approved by you or not? Uh, not really. You should you should know um, for your presentations and for your papers. I would say you you should really have your paper topics uh, rolling by the second week of February. At least have your topic chosen because you don't want to leave it much longer than that. You've got other things going on in life. Um, you know, to good, do a good job, chip away at it here and there. Um, so I would say by February the 10th, have a, have, a, have a reading area chosen. I mean, this week or next week, you should really have a topic reading area chosen. Paper topic might take you an extra week or two just to settle into the class and get some ideas. Good, and then if you see, if you look at the topic list and the topics that we're covering, the last time this course was taught, it was taught in a one-week intensive module where we just did three-hour blocks of lecture and had a break and just uh, charged through everything. And so I wasn't sure exactly how it would break down class by class time-wise, so we've got a little bit of flexibility built in here. Uh, you'll see that in terms of the topics that we're covering and uh, that as well allows for some discussion on the readings to play into the schedule. Any questions? About those. Uh, the MDiv students, those who are in 327 will only do a paper presentation, will not do a topical area of reading presentation. And that's simply because at the MDiv level, this is meant to be a very short, light course. It's only worth one credit hour. And so it's not fair to burden them beyond the reading they already have and a paper uh, in terms of assignment work. And so that presentation will be based upon the research paper? It'll be based solely upon your research paper. Basically, you're just presenting your research paper work. So it's killing two birds with one stone. You're just talking about the work that you've done, which is the same for the THM. When you're presenting your paper, you're presenting to us what you've done. So, 
Good, but do remember the papers are due at the end of the course. You have to present on your paper before it's due. So that means you have to have a good idea of where you're going a couple weeks before you hand it in and ha be able to talk about the topic with some articulation. Good, any questions on any of that? If not, I'd like to read with you from Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 6 through 8, Jesus' parting words there to the disciples. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Scotland fits in with the uttermost part of the <laughs> earth. So let's open in prayer together. Lord our God, we thank you for the opportunity to embark on this course. We pray that as we study the history of your church in this one small part of the world, that you would uh, use this to uh, bless us, uh, bless us through uh, the sound teaching of men who have gone before us as they expounded your word. Lord, we pray that you would help us to learn from uh, the ministries of men, from both their strengths and their weaknesses, uh, to learn from both the triumphs, the joys seen in your church, as well as the, the struggles, Lord, and the declines. Uh, Lord, we pray that this would be instructive for our hearts and that above all, uh, we would be reminded that you are the one who is the king of your church, the savior uh, of your body, Lord, the redeemer of sinners, the one who uh, works uh, your grace gloriously, uh, bringing a people unto yourself. Lord, we pray that as we trace these things uh, in this nation, and beyond it, through a missionary movement, that you would uh, cause our hearts to rejoice, to be reminded that you are faithful, to be reminded of the calling that you've given to us in our generation, uh, wherever you place us in this world, uh, to uh, serve you according to your word, with faithfulness, with love, with great humility and thankfulness, as we consider your great, great grace towards us. So, Lord, we pray, bless each one of the brothers here and those who are joining us by distance in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, today we're going to begin just with an introduction to Scottish church history in the next 25 minutes here. Uh, let me pull up this PowerPoint again. We're going to begin uh, just by looking at a map of Scotland to get a sense of uh, what we're talking about for those of you for whom this country is mostly a name. Can you see that screen? Is that visible? Should we turn the front lights off for the... Um, might be helpful. Flat, that would be fine. What's that? Flat, but that would be fine. Okay, but when, when I just make a line here, I put only the screen. Okay. I can do that as well. As long as there's no glare, well, yeah, either you can flip back and forth, whatever you want to do in terms of the distance students. 
but as long as you guys can see. All right, well, Scotland is divided into three main regions. We have the Highlands uh, here, and then we have uh, the Central Lowlands and then the Southern Uplands. Most of the current and much of the historical population of Scotland has been down here in the south. And so not in the north, and today as well. Uh, that's the reality. Most of this population, most of the industry, the business is found uh, down in the south, the large cities, Edinburgh, Glasgow. Um, if you had a bit further north, I suppose Dundee, Perth would be another that sort of region, quite popula populated, Aberdeen on the coast uh, up here. Uh, Dundee and Perth uh, right here. Yeah, Perth is a little ways, yeah, a little ways in. Uh, and then as you head to the north and the west, population dwindles. And, uh, a few is anyway. Pardon? A few is. Well, yeah, I suppose there are sheep. It's relatively mountainous compared to the rest of the United Kingdom, the still United Kingdom despite the latest referendum. Uh, highest peak, Ben Nevis, is the highest in the UK at 1,356 meters. There are five other mountains of more than 1,200 meters. Uh, and of course, especially with the sea right alongside, some of those elevations are quite, quite striking, coming right up from sea level. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah. All right, Ben Nevis, down, did I have it right? Close, a bit further Close. north. A bit further north, way up here. Yeah, it's about halfway. Somewhere. Yeah, that's the sky there. Yeah. But I leave my geography to our two brothers who hail from this parts. 787 islands, ranging from large rocks to land several hundred square miles in area, the largest and best known. Of course, we have Shetland and the Orkneys up above, going off this picture. And then uh, to the west, you have the islands of Lewis, Harris, Skye, Mull, uh, Islay, so the Hebrides, and then other islands as well. Today, only about 130 of these 787 islands are inhabited. Uh, but this was not the case in the past uh, when many of them were. Uh, climate, fairly moderate, fairly temperate, and uh, remarkably so really compared to its northern latitude. Uh, if we go straight across, Inverness is the same latitude as Kodiak Island, Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, if you go the other way, we're sort of St. Petersburg, Moscow-ish, uh, cutting through the southern parts of Scandinavia. Uh, lots of rain, uh, between uh, 600 to over 4,000 millimeters a year, parts of the highlands on the west coast where it rains pretty much every day. Or very close to that. What were some of the historic industries? If we go back uh, through this period, well, people would be engaged in fishing, farming, uh, forestry, and then uh, trade and manufacturing in the central lowlands and up the east coast of Scotland. And there'd be real varieties, as we'll see as we go through church history. Theologically, there'd be differences between the different areas for much of the history. Uh, in terms of where you'd have strongholds of Presbyterianism early on, what would be Roman Catholic uh, as we move later in time, where the Episcopalians would have their stronghold up around Aberdeen. Uh, and so these regional varieties, geography sometimes plays in to theology as well, and where different families and uh, clans, tribes have been located. 
Well, we'll begin way back with the Picts. And just to skip through a few slides here, give you a little bit of idea of the scenery of Scotland's the Isle of Skye. Uh, Eileen Donnan Castle, which is on the west coast. And then here we have a map as we begin our church history, beginning really before the history of the church in Scotland. Uh, it's fascinating. The Picts lived in Scotland uh, way back. Uh, there are Pictish cairns that date back or have been dated back, at least by archaeologists, to 2000 BC, which is the time of Abraham. Uh, there are people living here. And so we don't know. I mean, time of Abraham, the dispersion after the flood, were there still some people who feared the Lord, had some awareness? Uh, but in intervening times, certainly by the time the first missionaries come, it is just sheer paganism uh, among the Pictish peoples and uh, their subgroups, the other groups there, the Scots and others. We don't even know the Picts' own name for themselves. Uh, the pic word Pict is said to be derived from the Latin word Picti, uh, which meant the painted people. And uh, some argue maybe derived from a tribal name like Pexa. A traditional lore refers to them as the Pects. Uh, we don't have uh, their own records. There's a list of kings that we have, but really what we know of them comes from Roman, Irish, and Anglo-Saxon sources, so surrounding sources. Uh, they occupied mainly the more fertile grounds uh, from what, we, again, we are aware of uh, along the eastern coast of Scotland in terms of the Picts, and then the Scots and the Britons uh, further to the south and somewhat on the west. Well, when did Christianity enter into this area? Well, we know that in terms of the Picts, it's somewhere between the 5th and the 7th century, so the early church period. That's the late point. Uh, there is some argument. Uh, here's a picture of one of these Pictish cairns. This one is a Karimini cairn, and this is uh, one that's dated to around 2000 BC, uh, a Pictish burial site. Well, the Romans, of course, between the 5th to the 7th century when Christianity comes in through missionaries, we know the time of Columba and others, uh, the Romans were there prior to that, right, already in the uh, first century. And uh, it is believed that there may, may well have been some Christian presence at that time because we know that there were Christians in Roman Britain to the south. And there were several waves of persecution under Roman emperors of Christians in Britain. And there's some thought that some of those Christians may have sought to flee persecution to the north into the region of the Picts. But again, that's hard to verify. Uh, the Roman records of these people, uh, they're... Uh, Ptolemy and others uh, recorded lists uh, of these tribes. This is Ptolemy's uh, names. So These are Roman names that were given uh, to these different people groups that were known uh, in the period of the latter Roman Empire. Here we have a medieval illuminated manuscript. This is from after the time of Ninian, preaching to the Picts. He is the first recorded uh, Christian 
to have arrived here as a missionary. He lived roughly between the year 360 and 432 AD. So we're talking here roughly corresponding to uh, the lifespan of Augustine. He acted as a missionary to Galloway, Southern Picts. We don't know much about his life. Scholars have uh, debated the dates of his career. Uh, the established view is that he uh, arrived in Scotland during the early part of the 5th century. Uh, some have challenged that and say he might have actually lived in the latter part of the 5th and into the 6th century. We really don't know much about him. According to Bede, the early English historian of the medieval period, he says this, Ninian was a most reverend bishop and holy man of British race, who having been instructed in the mysteries of the Christian faith in Rome, uh, then uh, went to serve as a missionary. His see, or his charge, uh, is now held by the English, says Bede. The place is known as the White House because he built a church of stone, which was unusual among the Britons. So Bede says this, and uh, uh, he claims that Ninian, uh, through Ninian, the gospel advanced among the southern Picts a long time before Columba arrived in the year, around the year 563. But again, Bede gives no specific dates, um, though Bede is writing in the 8th century, so he's a lot closer to that time period than anyone uh, who would speak to it later on. Well, Columba, next figure, much better documented in terms of actual influence in Scotland. His name was Colum. Colum Seal. He was an Irish monk. Uh, he initially became a monk in Ireland under Finian, but apparently there was a dispute that took place in his monastery uh, over a manuscript of the Psalter, which he had copied. And these Irish monks were very much into singing and reciting psalms, and uh, some dispute broke out. It resulted in violence, a physical fight. And Columba was blamed for it. He was exiled from Ireland. But he was allowed to leave with a group of monks to form a monastery on the Isle of Iona. Well, the typical pattern of Irish monastic missionary endeavor or Celtic missionary endeavor was to go out in teams of 12. And so you'd have 12 monks who would go off to some pagan area they would settle there, and right away, they would set to work building a church and a school and a little compound that they would live in. And then they would begin to seek to, they would right away, they would start holding worship services and try to engage with the local pagan populace and encourage education in the school. And uh, this is believed to be the same pattern followed here. We see this in Columba. They go out in teams, Diona. They s establish a monastic dormitory, church, and school to seek to preach to and teach the local peoples the gospel, the understanding of the Christian faith. Now, we should mention at this time in Europe, uh, around the time of the 6th, 7th century, there are really two kinds of missionary advance, so-called, in Europe. The Frankish kingdom under Charlemagne is seeking to advance the gospel by the use of the sword, by and large. And so they'll conquer areas, and they'll just force people to become Christians, die or be baptized. And that creates a lot of resentment among some of the pagan tribes. Not surprisingly, I shouldn't say it wasn't the only way. There were Frankish monks who actually simply went as missionaries to preach, but 
in terms of the Frankish kingdom, that's the way it operated. Uh, it just held those two hand in hand, politics and religion, and we advance our political sway, and with that comes the church, and uh, it's forcibly placed upon you. Uh, the Celtic model was different, as was the model of some of the other European missionaries, and it was uh, really the, I'd say, the biblical model that was dependent on preaching and teaching. Now, in terms of conversion, it takes place in Scotland. Here we have a picture of St. Columba Abbey at Iona, which um, I believe all of the buildings, none of them are original to the time of Columba, as far as I know. I think there's uh, maybe a Pictish stone or two that has some of that cross-like carving on it that may date from that time period, but the buildings, I think, are mostly from a later period. But that's at least where... Uh, Columba and his little company began their missionary endeavor. Um, here's a picture of what's called King Brood's Hill near Inverness. King Brood was a leading Pictish king. He had a stronghold on this hill. This is a ruin of it. He's under these purple flowers. Um, and he was one of the first key figures to convert from Pictish paganism to Christianity through the efforts of Columba, on one of Columba's journeys. And his conversion seemed to mark something of a turning point in this region of Scotland. Question? Yeah. At this point, like with the Celtic model and even with what, what Rude <coughs> right. converted to, yeah. uh, are we talking something already influenced by the sacerdotalism, etc., of Rome, or is it too early? It's hard to tell. Okay. Uh, it, is, it is really too early for some aspects of that in terms of transubstantiation. Uh, that's really becoming a heated debate around the year 800. And I would argue that the transubstantiation side was an innovation and so prior to that, uh, generally there's a more orthodox view of the Lord's Supper. Um, by the time of Bede, you do have some sort of, I mean, Bede's got some wild and wonderful tales of uh, dust of martyrs blowing around and healing people in the next village and um, sort of, so, but he's writing around 800, 900, which um, is a bit later than this period. This, I mean, the period of, Augustine of Hippo, I think there's every reason to believe, you know, the account of Patrick, his conversion, it's, it's a mix as you read it. And I think you see some glimmers of the gospel there, reading it charitably, optimistically maybe. Um, but there's every reason to believe that they could have been simply faithful preaching of the gospel. But we don't have the records to know exactly what was being preached. Simon. Was back in the early 700s. 700s, okay. Sorry, 8th century, 700s. Um, he died 735. Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good. And so uh, Columba goes and he ministers in this uh, region, and this is uh, where we get the first reference to the Loch Ness Monster as well. Uh, as a side note. Uh, no, it was Columba. It's all Columba's fault. Apparently, Columba came across a group of Picts who said they were burying a poor little man who'd been killed by a monster. They had saved a swimmer with the sign of the cross and the imprecation, you will go no further, further to the beast, which then uh, fled away terrified. And this was Columba saying this. This apparently amazed the Picts, and they then glorified God. Uh, we don't know whether the incident is true. This is according to a text from Adominan. Um, 
The dominant says that the monster was in the river ness, not in Loch Ness. And what this monster was at this time period, I mean, it could have been a bear. Uh, who knows, you know, what? But anyways, the legends have built up to this dinosaur-like creature that swims around in the lake. Uh, but the important thing to note here is that the gospel is being proclaimed, or at least Christianity in some form is advancing into these areas. And that becomes evident. Again, we don't have a lot of written records, but what we begin to see all over Scotland is burial changes. And instead of Pictish cairns being used, the cairns of paganism, we now see grave markers which have indication of Christian symbols on them. And so this is a Pictish Christian burial stone, which would be different than a pagan burial marker or setting. So we see this, this change. So through Celtic missions, early Christianity gains a foothold uh, through Scotland into parts of the Highlands, not also all of the Highlands. It's interesting, the area of Applecross, which is on the west coast of Scotland, close to the Isle of Skye, still around the year 1700, we have accounts uh, of, I think it's from an itinerant missionary, if I remember correctly, who comes over the past the cattle, it's called down into Applecross, and uh, finds out that they're still sacrificing bulls to pagan deities. And so um, what happens in Scotland, you have this early Pictish Christianity, then you move into medieval Roman Catholicism. And some of that is just syncretism, and even that Roman Catholicism doesn't really reach into all of the areas of the highlands. Some of them really effectively are just still pagan um, through um, much of the medieval period and past the Reformation. They're still basically pagan. Uh, some have argued that, uh, and I think there's a good argument for this, that the gospel really doesn't come to the highlands until the post-Reformation period, well after John Knox, 150 years later uh, or so, which if we look at it in other ways is, is fascinating, thinking here, well, where is Christianity still the strongest in Scotland? You think in the south? Yeah, I think the Western Isles and the Highlands, in terms of communities with people going to church. Oh, you mean in Yeah, now. Yeah, in Nottage, sorry, I thought you mean in Nottage, sorry. Yeah, Nottage, that's definitely in Nottage. Right. The Highlands and the Islands, which are actually the most recent area to have the gospel in Scotland. When we think of Roman Catholicism's long stronghold, in the Highlands uh, to the days of Bonnie Prince Charlie and uh, all of that, uh, that, that's really the last area to be evangelized and uh, for revival and gospel advance to take place. And it, it's interesting in some ways, we look at the advance of the gospel through the history of Europe or North Africa, uh, sort of like a wave that goes along Right? and seems to ebb behind it and decline. All right, so we know that there is, uh, at best, as we move into the middle of the medieval period, there, there is syncretism uh, along with Roman Catholicism. Uh, Along with the Pictish tribal influences, you also get the Viking Scandinavian influences around the year 1000. And uh, the Vikings, as they invade, again, there's another wave of paganism. Uh, and they settle, particularly along the east coast of Scotland, uh, quite substantially, and in the north. 
In fact, the Orkneys and the Shetlands stay under Norwegian control through much of the Middle Ages, politically and ecclesiastically. Uh, they really become part of Scotland uh, politically much later on. Well, brothers, we need to stop there for today. And next class, we will pick up really looking at what was Scottish church life like just prior to the Reformation to get a sense of, you know, what context is John Knox, what context is the Reformation taking place in. So hopefully this has set the table, set the stage, um, given you a bit of a taste. Here's the, the pass of the cattle to Apple Cross. You can go up this incredible pass and over top to this remote area on the other side, um, which was only accessible by boat um, for a long time, unless you would hike up through the mountains. And that was that area was sort of a last pocket of paganism, uh, just blatant paganism. In the time, yeah, almost the lifetime of Thomas Boston, um, it's still pretty, pretty pagan. Uh, mixed with Roman Catholicism in this area. Any questions? They did. They did syncretize a lot. There were some movements within Roman Catholicism, within medieval Roman Catholicism, that were opposed to syncretization. But there were others that were very content to syncretize. Uh, the Jesuits, as they go to the Far East, they are quite happy to syncretize to quite an extent um, with Asian religions. Uh, and so, so we do see that pattern in many places. I mean, Isaac would say probably India is the same. I'm thinking of Japan uh, in particular, but certain Mexico, mm -hmm. Central America, South America, they syncretize. It's interesting that the Roman Catholic Church, it's, it's like a chameleon in some ways, because when they land in a Protestant country, they will syncretize to Protestantism to some degree. And so your typical Roman Catholic Church in the city of Grand Rapids will look more Protestant and the priests will speak in ways that sound more Protestant by a long shot than they do in Quebec in Canada or than they do in areas of Boston that have always been Roman Catholic or than they do in New Orleans or certainly in Mexico. And so, uh, Roman Catholicism has always been a big tent and has always been capable at adjusting uh, to local situations in that way. Yeah. David, could I ask you to close in prayer with us? Are you with us today?